Hi, uh, this is Dr. John Grazel, and uh, this segment is actually the summation of our immediate course in peace building, post-conflict reconstruction, and international development. How do we bring this all together? Now, at the very beginning of the course, among the things we quoted was a very well-known quote by Margaret Mead that basically says that people say a few dedicated people can't affect the world, but in fact, that's the way the world has only ever changed. And at the end of the course, we return to uh, uh, another quote, a more extensive quote from Margaret Mead in a book she wrote in 1975 called World Enough, uh, where she put out on paper really her deepest aspirations, thoughts for the world. And in it, she particularly identified an interesting paradox that we face. We are now in a world where no one knows the future. The old no longer can tell the young what is to come. Together, the young and the old, intergenerationally, must, must make it this new world and adapt to it. Uh, and to do this, we have, in fact, at our disposal, vast amounts of knowledge and vast capacities. Knowledge and capacity so great that we not only can transform the world, we can destroy it. We also now have billions and billions of people, and within those billions of people, our daily lives and billions of daily lives, and the majority of those daily lives are made up of small but good deeds, uh, of people helping each other, of a mother nursing a child, of, of a person healing another, of somebody helping, uh, uh, even within their profession, another to build their house or, or to, to fix their shoe or to manage their water system. Uh, the question and conundrum that faces us is the missing middle. Why, if we have such vast capacities and such vast knowledge and so many people working uh, on a daily basis, why do we find that the problems that face us are becoming in many ways more daunting? It's, we cannot get rid of poverty, uh, no matter how rich we seem. We have diseases, not only new diseases, but we have old diseases that in half the world there isn't malaria, but in half the world malaria remains one of the greatest killers. Why can't we get rid of this? Uh, we see actually people's mental health and spiritual well-being that seems to be getting decaying, not even make, being stabilized. What is missing? Now, in this course, what we talked about was uh, a simple formula for mutual aid in beginning to address that missing middle, because we said that missing middle is really a question of relationships. We have the two ends, but we don't have things linking them on an ongoing daily basis, and that it is really about relationships. Relationships that are systematic, cooperative, sustainable, and equitable. And that's why Mead, you know, when Mead gave, spoke, she didn't talk about people as individuals. She spoke, spoke about a small number of people, a group, because a group is a relationship, a relationship of integrity. And by integrity, I mean it, the pieces fit together based upon a common purpose, uh, a mutual support of each other, true to the design in their operation uh, 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 and, and their continuity. Now, where do relationships begin? And this goes back to the very beginning of our course where we talked about empathy and sentiment. And we showed in the very neurology of people, mirror neurons, we're wired to feel for others. And we tend to think that we have a left logical brain and by exercise that will get people to act and feel differently. But the evidence seems to show that it's really the other way around. That it's through the heart that relationships are made. And it's when we have sentiment and empathy for others, then we can begin to work together. Now, once we get to that heart, we have to move to action. And to move to action that is meaningful, uh, you have to begin to use that left side of the brain. You have to use logic and knowledge. You have to have critical thinking. You can't just believe something. You have to be have motivated, caring. Without caring, there's not the motivation for really doing all the things that are necessary. You have to have principle-based action. And that means action that's based not only on pragmatic understandings, but it's guided by foundational principles that we agree upon. So as we go into this unknown, we are, we're like a flotilla that 
even if we're separate ships, we sail in the same direction. And lastly, we must have truly, total, honest, and constant reflection as to what we are doing and whether it's working and what are its consequences and whether we have to change and what we have to change outside ourselves as well as inside ourselves. Now, to do this is a massive a effort, but it requires each of us as individuals to begin to form those small groups of transformation. And to do that, my last admonition uh, to my students and to myself and all of us is we have to move to the front of the table. Uh, as small groups, small groups that can attract others, we move to the front of the table, not to grab attention, but to encourage others to join us. So like the sand in, a, in, uh, in an oyster eventually results in the formation of a pearl as others assemble around us. And to do that, uh, we go back to having to also remember the very basic lessons of this course. This course was called Peace Building, Post-Conflict Reconstruction and International Development. But what we've seen from history and example is peace building is about development. It's about progress and prosperity, not only material prosperity, but spiritual, psychological, and mental prosperity. We've learned that post-conflict reconstruction is not about reconstruction. It's about transformation. It's about transforming the situations, making sure you don't reproduce what are the causes of conflict, and that you actually produce alternatives of, that allow you to do the systematic, cooperative, sustainable, and equitable actions and behaviors that are the basis of international development. And that international development itself is no answer. It's not a universal answer. What it really is, is a, a vast reservoir of experience. It's a cauldron today of experimentation. And it's an arena for potential action for tomorrow. And that is the challenge that faces all of us. And hopefully, looking at, knowing this, taking this course, hopefully looking at some of these tapes, hopefully studying the vast amounts of literature will produce in a substantial number of you the inspiration, the motivation, the critical thinking, and the capacity to be like those little grains of sand from which we have to have the pearls of peace. The pearls of peace that have always been the major concern of all the great thinkers, of Immanuel Kant and his call for perpetual peace. In the document that founded this chair called The Promise of World Peace. In the call for peace of all great religious leaders and philosophical leaders. Uh, in the call for peace that's in the heart of every human being who cares for their family, their, their community, uh, and seeks meaning in their temporal and temporary lives. I leave you with that hope, that thought, and that aspiration 